So the last part of this section has to do with ordering numbers. We have a natural ordering, and we've been kind of working with it without speaking about it when we're drawing number lines. We put the negatives on the left, zero, and then the positives on the right. And there's a reason for that. So every rational number corresponds to a point on the number line, like we've seen. There are points in between the rationals, however, that are not rational. So that means they can't be expressed as a quotient of integers. I can't write it as a fraction. Okay, so if something's not rational, naturally, what do you want to call it? You've probably heard it before. Irrational. Irrational. If it's not rational, it's irrational. Hello. Examples of irrational numbers include pi, so it's a never-ending, never-repeating decimal, so I can't write that as a fraction. Or something like square root 2 or square root 3. Square root of anything that's not a perfect square is going to continue on. Okay, But we can't approximate what those are actually equal to. We don't have exact values because we'd have to round, but we can approximate using a calculator. So decimal notation for rational numbers does what? It either terminates or it repeats. We saw that in the last part of this section when we were doing the division. Sometimes it ended and it divided evenly. Sometimes it kept doing the same um, pattern for a remainder over and over and over again. But with irrational numbers, they never terminate, it's never ending, and it never repeats. So nor does it repeat. It's kind of crazy. A never ending number that never terminates, never ending, that never ends, hello, and doesn't repeat ever in the entirety of the number. Wow, it's crazy. So the largest class of irrational numbers we deal with is when we try to take the square root of a number that's not a perfect square. So our examples before of square root 2 and square root 3, those are part of that really big set that we deal with. All right, so the rational and irrational numbers together make up all of the points of a num on a number line, and we call it the real number system. Since now we haven't excluded anything. We've got all the rationals that consist of integers, whole numbers, fractions, decimals, and then the irrationals that never end and never repeat. So what does it look like on a number line? So if I've got my zero right here, I could plot pi on there, 3.14 something, continuing on. So 1, 2, 3, somewhere around here is pi. I could also plot a fraction, one half, or two, that's on there as well. I could also plot a negative, negative a half, or mm, negative one, two, three, four, why not? Got a lot of different options. Okay, or you could even put on there like root two, what is that one around? It's a little bit larger than one. This one's root 2. So inside of this large number system, anything that's graphed on a number line, we have a few different options. So any fraction, whole number, terminating decimal, these are our rationals. And anything like root 2 and pi, those are our irrationals. Irrational. So now we've kind of filled in the gaps between we could graph all of our rationals. Now what about the spaces in between there? What is that made up of? Irrational numbers. All right. So overarching, the real numbers, the set of all numbers on that number line, rational, irrational, and all that they entail. So the real numbers encompass them all. So the rationals are inside of the reals, 
real numbers to set of all numbers corresponding to the points on the number line. So again, I think it's helpful to draw a picture. Now that we've kind of discussed all the different sets, let's draw a detailed picture of what are we talking about. So kind of the grandfather of it all is the real numbers. Real numbers encompass everything. And from the reals, I have rationals, things I can write as a fraction, and irrationals, which just end right there because we can't break it up any farther. It's those funny numbers like pi or the square root of something that's not a perfect square. But again, inside of the rationals, what do we have? I've got the integers, which consist of both positive and negative integers, and zero. So inside of the positives, positive integers, what do we have? Inside of there, I also have the whole numbers, which include zero. And, well, technically, technically we need the positives and zero. Zero is not technically positive. So the positive integers and the zeros together, subset of that is the wholes, whole numbers. And inside of the whole numbers, we have the counting numbers, which are the naturals. Okay? Then they also have the negative integers. So those were our integers, and also from the rationals, we have ones that aren't integers, so fractions. These are the whole numbers, positive, negative, zero, and anything that can be written as a fraction. So rationals without integers, and we basically covered them all. So the real numbers is the big daddy, the real group, and you'll see this notation in math. That just means the real numbers. And we have rationals, irrationals. From the rationals, we've got integers, which consist of the positive, zero, and negative. If I have the positives and zeros, that's talking about the whole numbers. And then inside of the whole numbers, I have the naturals, just the counting. So if I take off zero, um, we have the naturals. Then we have what's left, anything that isn't written with an integer. All right. Yay. So this is just important to kind of grasp what we're talking about, but you won't ever be tested up, excuse me, tested on do the integers, do they fall inside the rationals, do they fall inside of the reals. You don't have to know it in detail, but just a good idea of what's going on. So we'll move on to ordering. Real numbers are named in order on the number line moving left to right. We've already kind of had that connotation in our brains for a really long time. So if this is zero, anything to the left of that is negative. So I can look at negative three. Anything to the right is positive, like one, two, three, four, five. Okay? And we know that negative three is less than five, since it's to the left on the number line. All right. So relating two numbers on a number line, we can use inequalities. So that little shark or alligator mouth open to the left means greater than. Okay. Greater than. So what's an example? Four is greater than three by one unit. Alligator open in the other way is less than. So two is less than three. That's true. If I have a little line underneath, I'm introducing the option of equality. So this is greater than or equal to. So for example, 4 greater than or equal to 4. 4 isn't larger than, but it is exactly equal to. So this inequality still makes it hold true. So the other way, less than or equal to.
So 3 is less than or equal to 3. And we have exactly equal to. So we don't have the option to be larger or less than. It's exactly equal to. So 5 is exactly equal to 5. Makes sense. So let's use those symbols to make these following statements true. So how is 2 related to 9? On the number line, 2 is to the left of 9, so 2 is less than 9. Negative 7 to 4, how are they related? Negative 7, again, is to the left of 4 on the number line, so it's less than. What about for C? 12 is bigger than 10, but if I throw negatives on there again, this one is to the left of negative 10 on the number line. What about for D? Can you tell the difference between the two, or should we get them in the same form first off to compare? So, negative 3 halves as a decimal is really negative 1.5. When we see it like that, what symbol do we need? Less than. And last, E. One half and one third. How are they related? Half is larger, greater than. All right. So now we're going to introduce a variable. So let x be my age. I am at least 23 years old. So if I want to represent that with a variable and an inequality, what's it going to look like? If x is my age, my age is at least... 23 years old. So I know I'm going to have 23. What does that mean? Can I be exactly equal to 23? Yeah, I have that option. Or at least larger than that. So more than 23. So I'm either greater than or equal to 23 years old. So we can represent a lot of different things using inequalities. For example, that last one, G. Let Y be the age preference of a babysitter, Jane. Jane prefers children age 5 and under. So, if Y is her preference, and we know the age that we're considering is around 5, she wants aged 5 and under. So, exactly equal to 5, or anything smaller than that. Little kids, no thank you, I want 5 and older, once they're indestructible. Alright, so, ordering. I can represent this statement, A less than B, in another way, an equivalent way. What is my other meaning? So generally we read left to right, but I could also read this inequality from right to left. If I read it in that order, what am I talking about? B is greater than or equal to A. So sometimes after we solve something, or for writing inequalities out, it makes sense to kind of flip the order so it fits our natural reasoning for how we read something. So write an inequality with the same meaning. Negative 3 greater than negative 12. So alternatively, negative 12 is less than negative 3. It'd be the same thing as if I'm saying, I'm taller than uh, Tom. Another way to say that relationship is Tom is shorter than I am. So just another way to say the exact same thing. But one might feel more natural than the other. Tom is a very short man. <laughs> All right. B, A is less than negative 5. What's another way that I could write that? Negative 5 is greater than A. But again, out of those two, which one feels more natural? I like to see the variable first, instead of the number. But again, whichever one you're comfortable, comfortable with, they mean the same exact thing. So all positive real numbers are greater than zero on the number line. All negative numbers are less than zero. We already knew that, but just to put it into words, write it down. So, if B is a positive real number, what does that mean? B has to be greater than zero, since it's to the right on the number line. And if A is a negative real number, then A has to be less than zero. So, when we're setting up word problems, 
in talking about the different variables involved, we can label them like this. And it'll be shorthand, it'll be faster to discuss. So try, write another inequality with the same meaning. Those two different problems. All right, so equivalent inequality to the first one. What did you have? Reading from right to left, 7 is greater than or equal to, nope, just kidding, just greater than, negative 5. Thinking ahead to the next month. All right, and for B, again, reading, this is more natural, but we can write it the other way. 4 is less than x. Awesome. So moving along, we want to determine, are these inequalities, these relationships, true or false? So, is negative 3 less than or equal to 5.2? That's true. It's not equal to, but it is less than, so it's satisfied. What about the second one? Is negative 5 less than or equal to negative 5? True, because it's exactly equal to. And what about negative 3 greater than 1 and 5 sixths? So we don't even really know what 1 and 5 6 looks like as a decimal, but is a negative ever larger than a positive? Oh, so that one's definitely false. But again, we could approximate that as a decimal. It is 1.83 repeating. And then you could compare, but again, a negative is never going to be larger than a positive. Doesn't make sense. So that last little part of this section that we want to talk about is the connotation of absolute value. Naturally, what do you think it is? Hacking off the negative. But that's not true. Absolute value just doesn't magically get rid of the negative. So what does it mean? On the number line, opposites like 3 and negative 3 are the same distance from 0 on the number line. Same distance. But negative 3 is in one direction from 0. Positive 3 is 3 units in the positive direction from 0. So, absolute value really means distance. How far from 0 on the number line is my negative or positive value? So, when we're talking about distance, can distance ever be negative? If I walk forward 3 steps, do I say, oh, and then I walked negative three steps? No, I would say, no, I walked three in the other direction, turned around. So distance is never negative. Big old fat no. So that's why our absolute values are always positive, because absolute value is really distance. Distance, not just hacking off the negative. So we call the distance of a number line from 0 on the number line, the absolute value. Absolute value of the number. So on your number line, for example, plot positive 4 on there, 1, 2, 3, negative 4 on there. I guess I should make them points in that line so you can see them. And the absolute value of negative 4 is positive 4. So why is that true? Negative 4 is still 4 units away from 0, and the absolute value of a positive 4 is still 4 as well, because it's 4 units away in the positive direction. So again, we're talking about distance from 0 on the number line. That's why it's always positive. So we use that symbol of the two lines, two large lines outside of our number, to represent the absolute value of, in this case, x, whatever we're plugging in. So, find the absolute value of the following. Absolute value of negative 7. How far away from 0 is negative 7 on the number line? 7 units away. How far is 12 on the number line from 0? 12 units away. How far is 0 from 0 on the number line? If I start here and I don't move at all, it's 0 units away. It's both neither positive nor negative. And 2 thirds. How far is 2 thirds on the number line away from 0? 2 thirds of a unit. All right. So 
So finding the absolute value. If the number is negative, its absolute value is its opposite. So if I had a negative and I take its opposite, it's positive. So opposite. And if a number is positive or zero, the absolute value is that number that's written there. So that's a mathematician's like greatest fear, students thinking the absolute value just hex off the negative. Absolute value is distance. Keep that in mind.